Hello, everyone. This is Shasta Hensley with the Kentucky Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Early Learning. Thank you for joining us as we share the latest edition of our Fall Instructional Strategies webcast series. This webcast is a collaborative effort between the Kentucky Department of Education and the Kentucky Special Ed Regional Cooperative. The team is providing a rich collection of ideas, supports, information, and resources. As a disclaimer, many of these resources have been utilized and helpful to other teachers in supporting behavior. Please note that the KDE or the co-ops do not endorse these products. Today's presenters come to us from our regional cooperatives. Let's go ahead and let them introduce themselves and get started with this great presentation. Hi, my name is Joanna Jones. I'm with Green River Regional Education Cooperative. I'm Carla Mangles. I'm a professional learning coach with WKEC, which is the West Kentucky Educational Cooperative. I'm Christina Krantz, educational consultant with Central Kentucky Educational Cooperative. Thank you for joining us for our presentation on using self-monitoring to support student behavior in any setting. This webinar was developed by a task group from the Kentucky Special Education Cooperatives. Some members of the task group will be presenting today's information. We value your input and hope you will provide feedback on the information presented by using the QR code that will be shown at the end of this presentation. During this session, we will introduce self-monitoring and the supporting research. Learn and understand the steps of implementing the intervention. Finally, we will understand how self-monitoring relates to SDI. Whether in person, virtual, or a hybrid model, students may tend to be off task. This student, while attending virtual instruction, may appear to the teacher to be on task. But notice the books he has on his lap. Self-monitoring is beneficial for helping assist students to stay on task while monitoring their own behavior. Self-monitoring is student-driven, highly adaptable for different situations, and can easily be combined with other interventions. Promoting student independence is also an advantage of self-monitoring. Numerous studies have been done on the efficacy to self-monitor. It has been found to have positive effects for students with learning disabilities. It has also been shown to improve on-task behavior, improves academic productivity and accuracy. First, let's discuss what self-monitoring is. This intervention is good for students from pre-K through high school. It can benefit students with or without disabilities. It addresses difficulties with executive function, self-regulation, engagement, attention issues, academic performance, and strategy use. Self-monitoring can be used as specially designed instruction or even as an add-on to help foster independence so other specially designed instruction is more impactful. Self-monitoring has two components. Self-assessment is the evaluation of the presence or frequency of a target behavior. For example, a student could be self-monitoring the number of times they call or speak out in class. Self-recording is the documentation of one's self-assessment. An example of self-recording for the students monitoring the number of times they call or speak out in class would be a tally sheet, where a student makes a tally for each time they engage in the behavior. 
This intervention can look at either attention or performance. If students are self-monitoring attention, they will be monitoring behaviors such as time on task or time engaged in an activity. Students who use self-monitoring look at performance will be focusing on certain components of their work, such as task or assignment completion, following directions, or even use of certain strategies, such as deep breathing. Now that we have a basic understanding of what self-monitoring is, Let's talk about how to implement the intervention. There are six steps to consider to set up a successful monitoring intervention. The first step with self-monitoring is to identify an important problematic behavior. An example might be a student who is frequently off task during seat work time in math. Next, generate a positively phrased replacement behavior such as being on task. Then state the behavior in observable and measurable terms. For example, the student will stay seated, work on his assigned math problems, and raise his hand if he has a question. Another example of target behavior to address might be a student making derogatory comments to peers at recess. A replacement behavior for that might be the student will use positive statements when addressing peers at recess. One more example of a target behavior could be a student not participating in a virtual English class. A replacement behavior for that would be the student will participate daily through use of either the chat box or breakout room discussions in English class. Self-monitoring helps students engage in behaviors that they are already capable of performing rather than for acquiring or learning new skills. Therefore, it's essential that the target behavior is something a student can do independently. Self-monitoring works best with target behaviors that occur frequently and are readily observable. The next step with self-monitoring is to design data collection procedures and collect baseline data. The type of data collected for self-monitoring will depend on the target behavior being addressed. Here, you will see examples of a student behavior tally chart, a daily tally chart, and a weekly tally chart. Uses for these might be to tally the number of problems a student completes correctly, the number of times a student raises their hand to ask for help during a class, or the number of times a student participates virtually through chat comments or breakout rooms. Data could be converted to percentages to make it easily comparable over time. Here you will see an example of a momentary time sampling form with the accompanying graph, as well as an interval data sheet. When monitoring attention, this type of data would be collected to assess whether a target behavior is being performed when a cue is provided. A cue might be an auditory timer, a cell phone vibration, a simple teacher gesture, or some other predetermined cue that both the teacher and the student are aware of. Natural breaks could also be used to cue a student to check themselves for the replacement behavior. This might be done virtually when the teacher gives the class a five minute break, the student records whether or not they have participated by chat comments or breakout room discussion. Once data collection procedures are established, the next step is to collect baseline data. The first purpose of baseline data is to confirm the target behavior is appropriate. For example, if a student's baseline data reveals that they are already on task 90% of the time, a teacher would need to carefully reconsider the initial determination of what was problematic for that student. The second purpose of baseline data is to provide critical information about a student's level of performance before initiating self-monitoring 
so that a comparison can be made with data collected during and after the intervention. Here's one example of a graph showing baseline data in a line graph format. The line indicates the number of disruptions that occurred over a five day period before the intervention of self monitoring. This is an example of using baseline data to confirm the appropriateness of the target behavior and to compare data collected during and after the intervention. It's imperative to remember that without baseline data, it would be impossible for a teacher to reliably determine the effectiveness of self-monitoring. More information and resources on data collection will be discussed later in this module, and many resources will be available on a wakelet, which will be accessible by using a QR code at the end of this presentation. The third step when using self-monitoring to support student behavior in any setting is designing the intervention and preparing materials. When designing an intervention, there are several considerations that will impact the material you will use and how the intervention will be recorded. The materials or tools you need depend on the type of self-monitoring intervention being created. If you want to teach a student to self-monitor in order to improve their attention to task, you will need to select a method or tool that will cue or prompt the student to check their attention. If you want to teach a student to self-monitor in order to improve their performance in a certain behavior or skill, then you will need to select a method or tool for recording that behavior or skill at selected intervals or times during the day. Whether you are creating a self-monitoring intervention for attention or performance, common considerations for materials or tool selection are appropriateness. Is the tool or method of recording or prompting age appropriate? Does the student and teacher have the skill to use the tool? Will the tool create a cognitive overload and distract rather than prompt? How disruptive or stigmatizing is the tool? Does the student have access to the tool or materials needed to cue and record? Is the student willing to use the tool? Is this tool manageable? In other words, does it distract from instruction more than it helps? That's true from both the teacher and student points of view. Low tech solutions are designed to be simple. They frequently utilize old technology that may be considered out of date. Often low tech is considered less desirable, but this is not true. Low tech is frequently a better match for many of our students that don't need to be taxed with the burden of the addition of novel devices and potential failure rates. It is, necessary, it is not necessary to use expensive, complex tools to accomplish what a simple gesture can do. For example, a brief verbal prompt, gesture, or visual reminder to the student to use a selected cue or recording method may be sufficient to improve the student's behavior. Mid-tech self-monitoring methods use tools that are considered familiar to most. These tools are not state of the art, but do require basic knowledge of technology and may not be readily available in all settings. For example, is there a timer or watch in the home? And if so, can the student reset the timer and or read the watch? There are many ways to use high-tech self-monitoring tools. Cell phones, iPads, tablets, web platforms, and cloud-based documents can be used to self-monitor, cue, and record behavior. Free and fee-based apps, as well as teacher-created documents, can support self-monitoring. When considerations support it, using high-tech tools can reduce the workload on recording, self-reflecting, and analyzing behavior. One example of a high-tech app is iConnect. Developed by the University of Kansas, iConnect is a free, research-based, self-monitoring mobile app. It's been successful in classrooms in supporting students to independently stay engaged, on task, and accomplish their goals. 
The iConnect app is completely customizable and prompts can be set up for monitoring at home, including virtual learning time, chore time, and even free time. The fourth step is introducing and teaching self-monitoring to the student. When initially engaging students, spend time building rapport and creating buy-in. This can be done through fun web mail communications, phone calls, texts, or even postcards. Before beginning instruction, check with the family to evaluate their resources and needs, such as internet access. If student families have computers but do not have internet, consider delivering a USB with videos that provide modeling examples and non-examples, as well as the resources needed to implement and practice the strategy. In the event Wi-Fi or Internet is not available, files, forms, or documents shared from a teacher's drive should be accessible by the student in an offline format. Explicitly teaching self-monitoring will optimize the success of the intervention. One way to teach explicitly is following the explicit structure of I do, we do, you do. Finally, the process is discussed, modeled, and practiced daily. For example, as self-monitoring is introduced, the teacher models examples and non-examples while the student practices identifying what the behavior should look like. The student then practices independently, ideally in the context of where the strategy will be implemented. When possible, engage the family so they know what this looks like and can participate by prompting the student and giving feedback. The fifth step is to begin implementing self-monitoring with the student while monitoring their progress. The teacher monitors to ensure the student is engaging in the self-monitoring properly. Remember though, that the point of the intervention is to improve the behavior, not for the student to be able to fill out a form. So don't get too hung up on the accuracy of the monitoring, instead, Focus on helping the student become more aware of their own behavior. It may be helpful for the teacher to also complete a self-monitoring form at first to guide feedback, conversations, and additional instruction if needed. These are guiding questions to consider during implementation. Is the intervention being implemented in a virtual, hybrid, or in-person setting? Will the student recording of monitoring data occur electronically or by paper pencil methods? Who will be involved in supporting the intervention? Parents, caregivers, others? How will the data be collected and analyzed by the teacher? The next couple of slides are examples of a variety of self-monitoring forms, including paper pencil forms that could be used as a hard copy or presented in a digital format. As stated earlier, a variety of behaviors can be self-monitored, whether in person or virtual instruction. Here are a few more examples of self-monitoring forms. Whether in the classroom or engaged in virtual learning, students using technology could be prompted to self-monitor using a Google form. In the example on this slide, students submit whether they are on task using the same Google form each time they are prompted, and the data is graphed on the link spreadsheet. This might also be achieved through the use of breakout rooms, small group check-ins, or by checking in or queuing privately using the chat feature. Some online learning tools have digital whiteboards for students to use during instruction. Examples include Padlet, Flipgrid, and Google Jamboard.
Self-monitoring data can also be used to guide in-person or remote feedback sessions with students. It will be necessary to compare your intervention data to your baseline data to determine if sufficient progress is being made. Procedures can be intensified or and extended based on what the data tells you is needed. For example, other self-management components such as goal setting and self-reinforcement can be considered. The final step involves addressing fading, maintenance, and generalization. The ultimate goal is for the student to self-manage without external supports across different contexts. As the target behavior shows consistent improvement, the intensity of the intervention should be carefully faded. For example, one way to fade would be to increase the length of time between prompts to self-monitor. Fading should be implemented and monitored carefully to ensure improvements in behavior maintained over time. Finally, intentionally programming for generalization is critical to ensure behavior improvements occur in different settings, across different activities, and in the presence of different people. To promote generalization, create opportunities for students um, to participate in different contexts. Today, we have discussed the six steps of implementing self-monitoring. We've shared some of the reporting, supporting research and how it relates to specially designed instruction. These are some of the research articles that we've used for this presentation. You can access those resources that we mentioned in the presentation by scanning this QR code or typing this link into a browser. Wakelet provides clickable links to the resources used throughout the presentation. Thank you for watching this module on using self-monitoring to support student behavior in any setting. Please remember to provide session feedback using the link or QR code shown on this slide. A link to the slides for today's presentation will be available on the Kentucky DOS website and the KDE website in the instructional resource section. We would like to thank KDE and the Special Education Cooperative Networks for the opportunity to collaborate and share best practices. We would like to thank you and all educators in Kentucky for providing meaningful educational experiences for our students. Remember that the special education cooperatives are here to support you. Please reach out to your respective region for additional support to share resources that you have developed locally.